in theory, increasing the number of points should make it more realistic. Yes, exactly. Ideally, would want things to converge, but they don't always. <laughs> All right. <coughs> So the last time we started talking about symmetric matrices and I was making the case or trying to make the case that symmetric matrices are very useful and they naturally appear in some objects like in quadratic forms it naturally leads to a symmetric matrix here because that's what I discussed before if you did not have a symmetric matrix there to begin with you can easily pick a symmetric matrix and you would have exactly the same quadratic form so you can as well just like start with symmetric matrices to begin with and the uh, important result we discussed uh, last time about symmetric matrices is that if we have a real that that is important real and symmetric matrix that's the spectral decomposition theorem and it's actually even true that we can find a um, rotation matrix, so SON, I mean special orthonormal rotation matrix, and a diagonal lambda, which is a diac n by n diagonal, such that A decomposes into Q, a lambda, and Q transpose. So this is like a, I guess, a stronger version of the strong uh, spectral decomposition theorem that you can, it's sufficient to find the Q, to, to pick the Q to be a rotation matrix, which is, which is nice. I will use that in a, in a little bit. When we will discuss uh, quadratic forms, how they can be expressed uh, easily in some canonical well-chosen coordinate system. By the way, this uh, spectral decomposition theorem has like some interesting consequences. One of them being that if I have a matrix like this, if I have a symmetric real matrix, and it also happens to be invertible, know that this this works. The spectral decomposition theorem works for any matrix, even if it's not in non invertible. That's completely fine, right? In fact, you can immediately <coughs> see. You can from from this decomposition you can immediately see if the matrix will be invertible or not. Do you immediately see that? <laughs> so if I if I'm given a symmetric square matrix, like I have a quadratic form or uh, I have some covariance matrix or anything that is naturally a real symmetric matrix, and if I compute the spectral decomposition, then I can immediately immediately tell if it's invertible or not. How do I immediately tell that. So I know that matrix is invertible if and only if its determinant is non-zero, right? But the determinant of A, now I can compute very easily, right? Because if I have this decomposition, then this just will be the de determinant of the decomposition, of course. And we have the rules for determinant. This is the multiplication rule for determinant. And these are rotations, right? So the determinants here are one. And here the determinant of the diagonal matrix, that's just the product of all the element of the diagonal elements, right? So this is nothing but lambda one times lambda two and so on times lambda n. So it's super easy to test whether the determinant is zero or non-zero, right? It's gonna be non-zero if and only if all of these guys are non-zero, if all of the eigenvalues are non-zero. If one of them is zero, the determinant becomes zero and the matrix cannot be inverted. It's singular matrix. So once you have done eigen decomposition, it's very easy to test if the matrix is invertible. And we can do even more. Uh, if it happens to be invertible, we can also very easily invert it. That's like another application. This is the real power of these decompositions. The ultimate being the, the SVD, the single value decomposition. Just really not that, it's more like a, essentially what SVD is a generalization of this to non-symmetric and rectangular matrices. So we will we will get there. Let's let's stick with this one for a little bit. So let's say I determined assume 
the determinant a is non-zero, which means that a is invertible. And that also means that all the uh, all, all the eigenvalues are non-zero, right? Because if it was zero, determinant would be zero. I could not invert. So if it is invertible, then I could be asking, well, what is the inverse? How would you compute the inverse if I already have the spectral decomposition? It becomes really simple. That's that's the cool thing. So basically, like the decomposition does a lot of the legwork for you. Once you have it, the well, the rest of the linear algebra becomes very simple. So how do I, any ideas? How, how would I invert A having this decomposition in place? I can just use it, right? So A inverse is Q lambda Q transpose inverse. Then I have the product rule for inverse. So this would be Q, but Q, Q, Q was a rotation. So Q transpose, I could have also written as Q inverse, right? So this will be Q inverse inverse, which is just Q. Here I will have lambda inverse, and here the last one will be Q inverse, aka Q transpose, right? With a, with a rotation matrix or general orthonormal matrix, inverse is transposition. Did you get it? Right, we had this before that if Q is a rotation, then QT is Q inverse. So this is this is it. This is the inverse of A. So if, if A was Q lambda Q transpose, then to compute the inverse, all I have to do is invert this diagonal matrix. Inverting diagonal matrix is really simple. And we know that none of the diagonal elements can be zero, so I can actually do it, right? If, if one of them was zero, I couldn't do it. This would not be defined, it would be dividing by zero. That's not good. But that's, that's why I had to assume it's invertible, so it's equivalent to saying there's no, no, no zero on the, on the diagonal of lambda. And in that case, I just compute the inverse as simply as that. So in, in other ways, the, in, un, in other words, I could say that the spectral decomposition exposes the structure of the matrix such that it's then very easy to compute its inverse also. Normally, normally the inverse would be like an cubed algorithm or something like that. If you already have this computed, it's, it's super, super easy. Okay. Any questions on this? No? Everything okay? So let me continue with quadratic forms. I got it started. Quadratic forms are usually covered in linear algebra for good reason because it really ties very closely with the uh, eigenvectors of symmetric eigenvalues and eigenvectors of symmetric matrices. So we said that this is a general form of a uh, general equation for a quadratic form. I guess I could like call it like a function of x is this, right? And then to be like completely super accurate. It's a function that gives takes a point from Rn and gives me a scalar. Here is an example of quadratic forms for the R2 space where we can nicely, easily visualize it. And we also said that we distinguish these types of quadratic forms, the positive definite, negative definite, and indefinite. And these have also like, there are special categories are the semi-definite ones. So let me, let me uh, uh, recapitulate that. So positive definite meant that, what did it mean? That all the eigenvalues were positive. Positive semi-definite meant that the eigenvalues can be positive or zero. So I'm allowing zeros there. Similarly, negative definite required all the eigenvalues to be negative. Negative semi-definite would be negative or zero. And indefinite, that means that there are some mix. There's one plus, one minus. And that, that's also why, why this thing happens, why the indefinite one looks like in 2D like a saddle, because I have one direction where it's convex function, like 1D convex function. I mean, if I, if I slice this with a vertical plane in, in, this, in this particular point, 
So with one vertical plane, I get a convex function. With a different vertical plane, I get a concave function. That's a, that's a typical sign of indefinite quadratic form. Are you guys <laughs> with me? It's so funny that it's like so few of you, so don't be shy to try and interact. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, so I assume this is clear. And I think what we need to understand now, it, what, what is the significance of eigenvectors of a quadratic form? Oh yeah, I guess the other thing I could have mentioned is these level curves. We get these level curves if we intersect this with a uh, horizontal line. So if I like take another, like in, in the graph I take another flat paper and I just cut this thing in some height, right? That, that corresponds to doing x t x equals c and taking all points x which satisfy this, where the c is the height of my uh, horizontal plane I'm cutting this function with. So this gives me some curve. It can be a closed curve, like an ellipse, or it can be, or circle, or it can be an open curve, uh, like a hyperbola or parabola. So you remember what was, what were, what were the curves here for positive or negative definite? It's sort of like obvious from this. We just, someone say it. <laughs> or ellipses, right? Uh, circle being just a special case of ellipse. And here, here it's a little bit trickier. So if I take this shape, the subtle shape, and I cut it with a horizontal plane. Huh? Actually, hyperbolas. <laughs> I get parabolas, I get as a, as, a, as a degenerate case of these guys. I, um, I get parabolas if it's positive semi-definite or negative semi-definite. Yeah, but this is just like a terminology. So here is uh, explained what is the significance of the eigenvectors of the quadratic form. It has actually a nice like graphical interpretation. If we look at it as an equation of one of these conic sections of one of these curves, So uh, what, what happens here is that I know that A is real symmetric, right? So I can write its spectral decomposition. So that's what happened here. And I can realize that this thing is essentially the same thing as here, except for transposition. So here is QTX, QTX is here. And then I think, aha, so essentially if, if Q is just a rotation, so this is just a change of coordinates and meaning just a rotation of coordinates. So I can look at it as having two different coordinate frames, coordinate frame X and coordinate frame Y. Now we are not in the affine space, now we are just in linear spaces, so there's no translation. They are all, the both coordinate systems are centered at zero, which is good. The origin, the origin is the origin of the linear system. And here is a matrix of transition from one coordinate. The QT is a matrix which converts from X coordinates to Y coordinates. And the cool thing about the y coordinates is that if I say that this the y coordinates are QTX, then in the in the y coordinates the quadratic form becomes really simple. It just becomes the sum of the individual squares. So in other words, so let, okay, let, let me just comment on these equations. I already saw them before, but let's go through it a little bit slower. So here I just took QTX to be y. So this is y, t, lambda, y. Lambda is a diagonal matrix. So if I'm in 2D, it's lambda 1, lambda 2. Here are zeros. And if y is just a vector, y1 and y2, then this is just a sum, lambda 1, y1 squared, and lambda 2, y2 squared. And you can immediately see that what is... If I did this, lambda 2, oh my god so many mistakes lambda 1 y1 squared plus lambda 2 y2 squared equals some constant so this is uh what what curve is this so if i set all y1s and y2s and let me say that lambda 1 is positive and lambda 2 is positive to make it easier ellipse. exactly it's an ellipse right 
if if it happened that lambda one and lambda two would be equal, then I have a circle, right? So essentially, this is just like so. For for different right hand sides, I would get like different sized ellipses. But the point here, the the interesting thing here is exactly this change of coordinates because the, the eigenvector basis, the matrix Q, it's essentially a new frame of reference where I have a canonical ellipse. So if I if I look at this y1 and y2 as like new coordinate system, so this is this is like a canonical non-rotated ellipse. I guess it's more clear from uh, image. So a general ellipse, th that's the difference between what I meant canonical ellipse, I meant that it's aligned with the coordinate axis, but a general ellipse does not have to be. And the way I can find this, what, is, what I'll call the principal axis of the ellipse is exactly by taking the, the, the matrix of the quadratic form and taking its eigenvectors. Then these eigenvectors, so, so this, this would be the y1 and y2, and this would be the x1 and the x2. So the quadratic form is specified in the x coordinates, and the, the vectors y1 and y2 are the eigenvectors of the quadratic form, and they exactly recover the principal axis of the ellipse. And then if I, if I look at the matrix Q, which is just the matrix containing the eigenvectors, then the matrix Q is just a rotation which rotates from where? From x to y coordinates, right? So x is rotation from the x system, from the x coordinates, the that's the canonical one, to the y coordinate system. So that means, remember from when we talked about change of coordinates, that means that QT is a change of coordinates from where to where. That was, that was the only tricky part in the change of coordinates thing, right? So if I have a rotation which takes x1 and x2 and rotates it onto y1, y1 and y2, just like here, it'd be like, here would be like by 30 degrees or something like that. That then the inverse rotation changes is, is, is a change of coordinates from x to y, interestingly enough. Right? We, 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 we are talking about it. It means that q would be change of coordinates from y to x. So this is just to remind you how change of coordinates works. And if you look at it as applying, uh, so as m multiplying a vector by the matrix, we can write it out, or I guess as, as an operator, that might be a little bit more intuitive. So this is just a spectral decomposition, right? But when I look at it as an operator with respect to some coordinate frame, so the A would be an operator operating in the X coordinates, right? But then QT is a change of coordinates from X to Y. So this brings X coordinates to Y coordinates. Then lambda, what is a lambda? Lambda is a diagonal matrix, right? So this is a non-uniform scaling in Y coordinates. So you could, you could look at it, yeah. This is just scaling in y coordinates. And then q, that's a change of coordinates from y to x. Because we want to go back to x, we ultimately want the mapping from, from x to x coordinates, like a transformation in, with respect to one coordinate system. So this is really what the eigenvectors mean for a quadratic form. So here it's here it here it here it's summarized. The ellipse corresponds to the set of points where this equals some constant. We can just say one, right? Because the constant would just be scaling it. And the eigenvectors are these principal axes. And the eigenvalues, the lambda one and lambda two, they tell me the extents of the ellipse in both of these axes. 
and uh, it's it's ellipse for the case where both lambda one and lambda two are positive. If lambda one and lambda two were both negative, I would also get an ellipse. But the funny case is when lambda one has a different sign than lambda two, like lambda one is positive, lambda two is negative, or the other way around, then I'm getting a hyperbola. And in the case that lambda one or lambda two is zero, then I'm getting a parabola. Okay, I'll just a little bit more about the quadratic form. So this is just essentially the same thing as we saw before. So by doing the change of coordinates from x to y, where the y is the coordinates in the frame given by the eigenvectors, then the quadratic form becomes really just the, the simple sum of the squared coordinates. Just sum of lambda i, y i squared. And from this we can see, so we, what, uh, how did we define positive definite before? Before we said that po it's positive definite if all the eigenvalues lambda are positive, right? So we can see here that A is positive definite if and only if the quadratic form is always positive except for zero x. So when x is zero, that's the only case when I get zero for every other x, I get something greater than zero. So one way of the uh, implication is uh, simple, because if I have all, if my all lambda, so let's 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 try to do that. So one way this this would be this way of the implication. Let me just like sketch a proof or something. So let's assume that all lambda i's are positive. Well then obviously this, this thing has to be positive, right? It has to be positive as, lo as long as the y will not be a zero vector. But if I assume that x is not a zero vector, then y is just q dx, right? That means that the norm of y is the norm of q dx, which is just the norm of x. So if the norm of x was non-zero, then the norm of y is also non-zero, right? If, if of course if x is zero then y is zero and I get zero that's that's the, that's the special case but if x is non-zero then y also has to be non-zero and therefore the sum has to be non-zero and because the x x dx is the sum that also x d x transpose a x has to be greater than zero so that's one side of the implication the other side I said there is equivalence right so it means just a implies b and b implies a that's that's what's meant by this if if and only if i sometimes i like write it like this like a logical symbol that's that's which i guess denotes as like two-sided implications so the other side says that if x d a x is greater than zero for all non-zero x's then I need to prove from this that all the lambda i's are positive, right? So how do I do that? Well, let's look at the matrix Q. The matrix Q has some columns. Those are exactly the eigenvectors, Q1 to Qn. And let's say I pick one of them. Let's let's say I pick QI. So because they are eigenvectors, then QI certainly is non-zero, right? So, and I can say that this is this is my x. It's non-zero, so it must be true that QI transpose a QI has to be greater than zero. Right, so chill. Let me write it this way. So, QI transpose AQI is greater than zero. 
is the same thing just on the other side. But then I also know that A, I always assume here that A is symmetric real matrix. A can be decomposed like this. So this means that this is Q lambda Q transpose QI, right? And what happened, what, what is this? What is Q transpose QI? Let's think about it for a second. Q was orthonormal, or even a rotation, right? But here I only need the fact that it's orthonormal. So what is Q T Q I? Here I have Q, right? All these vectors are orthonormal. Anybody? Something very simple. Almost zero, almost everywhere it's zero, except for one coordinate where it will be one, right? When I hit QI, QI, I get one, right? So this is exactly the EI, the, the standard basis vector. So the, the EI is like, you're right, almost everywhere zero, except for one, one <laughs> on, on position I, right? That's, that's our standard, standard basis vector EI. I guess I could put like tons of arrows, arrows around, maybe, maybe, uh, could put arrows all over here so EI is also a vector of course so this is EI transpose then lambda EI and then if I the EI is really just this this simple thing so all this does is it exposes lambda I right and what I have it, if I put this together this this says that lambda I is, is greater than zero and that's exactly what I needed to prove because that, that, that means that A is positive definite. Yeah, so like if you have in a test you in the homework or final or something you have like a proof, then you need to write something similar <laughs> similar to that. Make sure you don't use some like stronger statement than you are proving because then that's usually not gonna count. <laughs> the proof needs to like persuade someone else if you just use some stronger state. Like for example, I could like prove almost everything here from the SVD theorem, but it's sort of stupid because what I'm doing here, I'm trying to build up towards that, right? So if I use that, well, <laughs> that, that it doesn't make sense. It's like proof by circle. So what the, the proof needs to go from like basic, basic facts like here. But I think you, you know that. So the same thing could be said about a negative definite matrix. So the negative definite, so a matrix which is square and symmetric is a negative definite if and only if this product is always negative for a non-zero x. So again, the only, it's, it's just like, like the same like here, just the other way around this inequality. Negative means it's always negative. The only exception being zero, of course, because at zero, there's no other choice than zero, but that's the only one, so that's the point. And you could probably guess what is indefinite, right? What is indefinite? If I have an indefinite matrix, what does it mean for the values of the, or the sign of the quadratic form? It means I can always find some vector x which will give me positive value and some vector x which will give me a negative value, right? And what means semi-definite? Semi-definite means that there is some vector which will give me zero and the vector is non-zero. But yeah, for, I think for now we are just fine with this basic relationships. Here is a funny thing, there is a geometric interpretation of, maybe I'll do it on a separate piece of paper, xtax. By the way, sometimes, sometimes this is how the positive definite and negative definite, positive definiteness and negative definiteness, how they are defined by saying that this is always positive except for zero x, always negative. So like you could like flip it, that you define it like this and then you prove the idea because these things are really equivalent, that's the point. So uh, 
my point here is to give you a geometric interpretation of this being positive for, of course, for x not zero. Again, for x zero, not interesting, right? So think about it. What does it mean geometrically? If I have some vector, some coordinate, uh, I don't even need the coordinate system, I guess. Um, I have some vector x, right? Then the matrix A can be interpreted as, as a transformation of that vector. It maps it somewhere, somewhere else. And this gives me some constraint or where the matrix A can map the vector X. If I look at it like geometrically, right? Can it be the case that I get like this result? Of course, when I ask like this, it means that this is not possible. <laughs> so what, what is this? X, T, A, X is nothing but, I think we wrote it like this, right? Dot product. Oh, wait, I think we wrote dot product like this, right? Because this is, this is a vector. This is, this is a vector, like, turned. In, this is a column vector. This is a vector turned into a row vector. So this is just a dot product, right? So this constraint, if I say this is greater than zero, this means this is a constraint on the dot product of AX and X, right? So my AX dot producted with X must be positive. What does that mean geometrically? So you should remember about dot, the fact about dot product is that it's the length of X, length of Y, times the cosine of the angle, right? So this is positive if and only if this angle is strictly less than 90 degrees, right? Because that's how cosine looks like. Cosine looks like this, as, as far as we are concerned. So it's only positive in this, in this, in this, or I guess in this region. So that means that the AX, so this geometrically, this constraint means that AX is less than this this angle is less than 90 degrees less than 90 degrees away from x or you could say that if i define a hyperplane with the normal x then the image of x by matrix a has to be in this open half sp half hyperspace half space half space yeah that's that's like you can look at it geometrically like this in other words, the matrix is not allowed to flip the vector on the other side. That's, I guess, the probably the most intuitive in explanation or interpretation of being positive definite. Okay. So here is where we use the quadratic forms. It's uh, comes up. It's it's from calculus. But it's super important because this is a general nonlinear optimization. This this appears in general nonlinear optimization. So, for example, when we will be doing phase-based animation, Newton's method, this this immediately appears there. And this these quadratic forms are really the basic theory for that. So it totally makes sense to look at this uh, immediately. But not not just physics-based animation. This this appears all over the place. Hessian matrices. So the point of Hessian matrices is, so maybe let me start with V, if you, especially if you don't have like a lot of calculus under your belt. So I was saying that uh, first order derivatives of a vector function are essentially a linear approximation of that function, right? It's like the first order approximation of a function. So if I have a 2D function, like I had these 2D functions before, right? At any point, I may decide that I take a locally optimal linear approximation of that function. I just fit locally the optimal plane for any point. I can pick any point anywhere, and I can fit the tangent plane, find the tangent plane. The tangent plane is exactly defined by the first derivatives of that function, right? Sometimes this first order approximation is not good enough, and we need to do second order approximation, and that's exactly what the Hessian is about. The Hessian is a matrix of second derivatives. So this means, so here we will consider a two-dimensional function. Of course, it works for general n-dimensional function. 
and here we will construct an optimal lo uh, locally optimal quadratic approximation at a given point okay so that's that's really the idea of, of hessian matrices so i have some function f f goes from r2 to r and i am at, at some point x y i pick some point i'm interested in when you are doing this based and this point would be like the result of the previous time step like some some state of your actually you are you are doing this based right now right with the stretchy spring so the stretchy spring is not just two coordinates this is like two n coordinates but that's the point where you are curious about your hash your stretchy spring is nice because there the energy is not complicated it's already quadratic and when it is already quadratic then the hessian is already the energy this really is is important for functions that are complicated and this essentially takes away the complication by just approximating by a quadratic function so this is other way how uh, another way how we can look at it if i have some really complicated 2d function can be whatever as long as it's smooth i can for any point find the locally optimal quadratic approximation to such a quadratic form plus the linear term plus a constant term which will be a second order good approximation of the function at that point and this this is how it's done it's no no magic it's just a 2d taylor expansion so this is say so the x and y is some special point i'm interested in and the delta x and delta y are just small perturbations so i just like look a small small distance away from x and small distance away from y and then from taylor expansion i i can write this as a constant term that's really just the value of the function at, at x and x and y here is the linear term so this would be the first order approximation so here i have first order derivative so derivative of the function with respect to x and derivative of the function with respect to y so this is really the slope of the change in x and y and here it's multiplied by the small displacement and here is the interesting thing here here is the hessian part here are the second derivatives of the function this one half just comes from the taylor polynomial because there is the one over n factorial term for for the for the order of the derivatives so you know we are this is second order so this is one over two we didn't see it here because it was one over one so i didn't didn't do anything and what we have here are uh, second derivatives of f so this is second derivative with respect to x this is the mixed second derivative so first differentiated by x second differentiated by y from calculus you know that it doesn't matter if i first differentiate by x and then by y or first by y and then by x i always get the same result and this is the second derivative with respect to y so i can write this in matrix notation so I group these first derivatives together to make a row vector. And I also group the, the small displacements into a little column vector. So this is, this is exactly the linear term written in matrix form. And this guy here, I can also write in matrix form. So here the second derivative with respect to X will come here. Second with respect to Y comes here. And the mixed one, goes split in the off diagonal terms so this is the the partial derivative with respect to x and y and notice that this thing here is exactly a quadratic form notice also the factor of one half and the fact that here here these things get summed together so here i would have twice this but there's the factor one half to to cancel that 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 two and here the one half corresponds to this one half so this is really correct so here is here is the fact the hessian matrix is a matrix of a quadratic form which we were just studying so th this is also why i'm discussing it at this point this matrix of first derivatives uh, you can call it jacobian Us usually it's called just just gradient you could just call the gradient of f You would you would talk about jacobian if you had a matrix from like rn to rm where this m is greater than one 
like if you had something from R2 to R2, then you talk about Jacobian, but here it's just a gradient. But the point here is the Hessian, which is a symmetric matrix, which is symmetric because the mixed partial derivatives are, are the same. So this means that the locally optimal quadratic approximation of any function, arbitrarily complex nonlinear function, can be captured just by a constant linear and quadratic term. So that also means that we can apply all we know about symmetric matrices there. In particular, it will have real eigenvalues and orthogonal eigenvectors, and there will always be full set of them. It cannot happen that this would be a deficient matrix, that there would be a shortage of eigenvectors. That can happen because it's real and symmetric. And we can even use it to classify the local extrema of the function. No matter how complex the function is, this, this as long as it's smooth, this, this always holds. So uh, if the first derivative is zero, so this, this first order term really is stronger than the second order term, right? It, it gives me the, the, the slope, and this just talks something about the curvature of that thing. I will explain that in a little bit in, a, in the next slide. If it happens that this linear term is zero, this constant like doesn't really matter much because it does not depend on the small perturbations delta x delta y. If it happens that the gradient is zero, then I am at a critical point of that function. Have you heard that before, critical point from calculus? Yeah. And what tells me if the critical point is a local minimum, local maximum, or settle, there are these three possibilities, is the Hessian. In particular, the definiteness of the Hessian tells me that. So again, if the gradient is zero, something is going on. I'm at a critical point. And what is going on, I can tell by looking at the Hessian. Specifically, if the Hessian is positive definite, then it means that I have this bowl-shaped situation. The function is locally, is convex in a small neighborhood of my xy point. And the point is local minimum. If it's negative definite, then it flipped the other way around, then I'm at a local maximum of the function. And it also can, can also happen that I'm neither at, at a local maximum or local minimum, that I am at a settle point. And that you can tell by realizing that the Hessian is indefinite. So this is really the meaning of the eigenvalues of the matrix. And there's also a good geometric meaning of the eigenvectors of the Hessian matrix. They are the directions of principal curvature and they are sometimes used in or they are often used in differential geometry because the notion of curvature essentially intuitively tells you how how much does it locally differ from a plane like the simple case is a sphere right and if i have a tiny if I have a tiny sphere then it then of course at any point it like curves a lot Right. If I have a huge sphere that at any point it like doesn't curve so much, right? If I have a gigantic sphere like the Earth, you can't even see the curvature because it's just so big, right? Ultimately, if you had infinite sphere, then it's just a plane, basically, right? So one measure of the curvature is exactly the determinant of the Hessian, which we know now that it's just the product of the eigenvalues. This is called the Gaussian curvature. And this uh, tells you locally if the point is like a local, local minima point, local maxima point, or a saddle. Yeah, so if it's, if it's negative, that means when it's negative, it means that one has to be positive, one has to be negative, right? Doesn't matter which one. That's, that's, the, that's the funny thing about product, right? If both are positive or both are negative, then I get a positive determinant. I guess I should probably say like a, like a saddle. I have a picture of a saddle here. 
So here is some, is it visible? That's pretty, pretty okay visible. Here is exactly the funny situation when I have a saddle point. So here is, a, so here is, here is where I'm interested in the local quadratic approximation. And uh, the, the function can be going arbitrarily crazy far away from that point. I'm really like concerned about like some small differential neighborhood of that point. I find the locally optimal quadratic approximation. I say that that's, that's this. And then the eigenvectors tell me, tell me the directions of principal curvature. Those are, those are these planes, cutting it into two curves. And here, because it's the case of the settle point, then I have directions where it's locally convex and concave in, in, the, in the other direction. Now the, the point that this is this is like not not the goal. This is just to give you. You will probably come across this again and again in other lectures, like in FIS based and probably many other ones. So this is just to give you uh, the idea how this ties to linear algebra and eigenvalues and eigenvectors, so that there is a relationship. Okay. And here is, uh, I guess, the final thing I would like to cover today. It's <laughs> what can be called as like the the evil twin of symmetric matrices, the anti-symmetric matrices. And this is really how it's sometimes called. So sometimes, maybe more often, it's called skew symmetric matrices, but some people call it anti-symmetric matrices, also correct terminology. And they are funny in the case in the sense that you know for symmetric matrix I know that AT is A, right? And for this, I don't know if I would call it evil, it, it has its purpose. <laughs> for the skew symmetric matrix, I get I also get the original one but with a minus sign. So the transposition flips the sign of all the elements. That's that's all it does. So if you think about it, it immediately means that the diagonal has to be zero right because the transposition does not move the elements on the diagonal and the only real number that has the property that is equal to its negation is zero right because i have a equals minus a of course a must be zero so that's why it's not a coincidence on the diagonal i must have zeros right and then what i have and then these these upper triangle and lower triangle are, they are like just like a mirror of each other, right? So if I have plus one here, I have minus one here. If I have minus two here, I have plus two here. If I have plus seven here, I have minus seven on the other side. Because what I want is after I make the transposition, I need to get this matrix with a minus sign. So this is an example of a three by three skew symmetric matrix. So why they are sometimes called anti-symmetric or why they are called like the evil twin of symmetric matrices is because for any square matrix, I can decompose it just using addition into a symmetric part and a skew symmetric part. That's sort of cool. This is this is this is of course the symmetric part, and this is the anti-symmetric or skew symmetric. So the fact that a plus a t is symmetric is obvious, right? If I just transpose it, I just get a t plus a, which is of course a plus a t. So it didn't change on transposition. If I transpose a minus a t, I get a t minus a, which did change sign, right? It's just minus a minus a t. So this is really the skew symmetric part. And of course it's a decomposition, right? Because this is one half of A plus one half of A, that's A. And one half of AT minus one half of AT is zero. So perfectly, works perfectly. Oh yeah, it's, it's also written here. So yeah, this is the symmetric part. This is the skew symmetric part. And I think it will be one of your homework problems to show that there is no such thing as positive negative definiteness for a skew symmetric matrices because this always is zero. I think this will be your homework. So I'm not gonna tell you now it's very fairly simple. Okay.
this is where we should stop and resume on Friday. Unless, of course, you have some questions, which you usually don't. <laughs> but feel free to have some. I encourage you to ask. <laughs>